in a strange time, people watching the future, this is kind of very, this is very nice when uh, people like this, talented people like this, give, uh, you know, give us bloggers some, t- some time of day and uh, make our days. And it's not just mine, it's everybody who's watching right now, all your fans, the reaction has been insane. What do you think of the reboot legacy all these years later? It's uh, something that I never imagined when we started doing the show. I think I was 23 when we started in 93. And I knew about the show because I was friends with Doug Parker, who should get a major shout out here because he's really the person that is responsible for casting me in uh, cartoons originally in Vancouver. And he is the guy I wouldn't be doing. I wouldn't have done Bob on Reboot without him. Um, he was involved with the development of it with uh, Mainframe and BLT Productions at the time. Okay. And I remember reading kind of the early, you know, pitch deck and seeing early drawings. And only when the audition day came to do the actual audition for the show, and I auditioned for all the characters I wanted to be in the show, they were playing a promo video that had been produced in the U.S. before coming to Vancouver. And there was a guy doing Bob's voice on it. And it sounded a lot like me. And I kind of went into the waiting room and I said to Doug, I go, is that me? And he goes, no. And I said, it sounds like me. He goes, oh, it does sound like you. (laughs) And I think at that moment, it kind of, you know, lodged in his brain that I would be the best candidate to do it since I sounded like the guy who'd done the promo materials. I know what you mean. A friend of mine, uh, Toby Proctor, he came on the show and he's the second tuxedo mask. And as a kid, I was just like, wow, it's almost seamless. It's amazing how... Some actors, you're not trying to sound like someone else, but it just happens. And uh, wow. you sound, and it's kind of funny. Like YouTube starts with your with your voice doing that narration. When you were doing that narration, did you ever think, like, 25 years later, and anybody uh, worth their salt who comes up to a con uh, at a convention will come up to you and just kind of all? I'm assuming they recite that to you on a you know a daily basis when you do those kind of shows. It's a, it's a funny anecdote. And, uh, did I ever think maybe I did because I, I kept everything, uh, you know, this time during the, you know, the, the COVID the lockdown here, I've had a lot of time to go through storage and I'm in Vancouver right now. And I went through stuff that was kept at my dad's place and then at my mom's place. And I found a box with all the scripts from the late eighties, early nineties. And then I found, the uh, original monologue for the opening from 93. And I put it on my uh, Instagram uh, and my uh, Facebook page for all the fans to see. And, uh, and it was interesting to note that the redone version, the final version was recorded just five days before the show aired on a Saturday morning on ABC. It was, it was interesting to see how, how you know close to the finish line they, they went. Five um, days. <laughs> Yeah. And to answer your question, um, I had not done conventions until maybe eight or nine years ago when Jim Sue, who was an animator on the final years of Reboot, contacted me and he wanted me to do a convention with him because he was uh, selling books for um, the show. And I kind of said, nobody wants to meet me or talk to me. He goes, yeah, they do. They do. So I went to Calgary, which was my first uh, con. And I remember the first person coming up to me saying, hey, I just want to say such an honor meeting you, you know, I grew up watching the show and you were my hero. And I remember looking at this person like, and I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop when they're going to be like, just kidding. And they didn't. And then person after person came up about five or six in a row. And then about the seventh person came up and it was a guy that said he loved the show. And then he kind of revealed his shoulder blade and he had a tattoo of reboot on his shoulder blade. And I looked to Jim and I said, well, this is real. He goes, yes, it is. I was like, wow, I had no idea. And then I was scheduled to do a talk to, you know, fans at the convention and the assistant came to walk me to the room. And as we were walking, there were about 200 people on a line. And I said, what are they lined up for? And they said, they're lined up to see you. I said, really? And they go, oh, that's nothing. Those are the people who are in the standby position. And then I went into the room and there were about 500 people in this room and I was kind of overwhelmed. And I had mentioned to Jim, do you think that they will know the opening monologue. And he goes, well, they might, they might not. I said, okay, so I had prepared something to read, kind of a a spoof, a satire of the opening like I did for you. And then I did that, and then I asked them if they knew it. And 500 people, unrehearsed, 
by heart like the Lord's Prayer recited the opening monologue of Reboot. And I was completely, uh, I, I, you can see the original tape I filmed. I said, go for it. And I videotaped them like this with my camera. Yeah. And I was at a loss for words and I kind of flipped it back to myself. And I, I don't know if you can see, I choked up. I, I almost, I got emotional because I never ever thought that that would be something that would live on, you know? And, yeah. uh, and then every convention I did afterwards, if I had the opportunity, I would have the group to do it themselves. And I, there's a couple of them on, on, uh, on YouTube and on, uh, Instagram. That's amazing, Michael. Um, something about that intro too, that it just, um, the, the show reboot to me was this incredible thing because not only was it the first, uh, stop motion, well, sorry, not stop motion, the first computer animated series, uh, yeah. fully, uh, computer animated, but also like they combined real orchestra orchestral music to really give it uh, more of a, a star Wars adventure feel. So if it, I right. find, I find if they just had techno music playing, it kind of would have canceled out the, you know, the realism they're trying to build up with those computer animated characters. It, it would have dated it for sure. Yeah. Uh, I remember when we were starting to do the show and it was gearing up to, to air. Uh, you got to remember it was a, a co-production between ABC Saturday mornings in the United States and YTV. And, uh, and they had some money behind them. And I remember they were saying, what do you think our opening music should be? And I suggest, I remember this so specifically, the song Connected. It was a song in the 90s because I felt it was very futuristic. And I, and I was thinking it would be something current. It would be, it was like very futuristic. Okay. But then they took it one step further, like you're saying, and made it kind of timeless with the orchestration. And when I saw the final cut and I saw it with that music and the orchestra, then I understood, oh, they're really going for long-term, um, you know, longevity on the show, that it would, would last long, wouldn't be dated. Yeah. And uh, what an effect it has. And seeing all that, seeing it like, you know, the beginning of a show is what brings you in. Uh, what, you know, when, what, when did you see this fully formed animation, uh, animated episode of this? Because, you know, you're recording lines, but, you know, right. it's, a, it's a whole different story when you see the finished product. Yeah. Reboot was, uh, is recorded pre-lay, which uh, a lot of fans might know is before they do the animation as opposed to dubbing which is done with anim anime, which is done in another language first, and then we add the voice to it. So they would animate to our performances after the fact. And um, I had not seen any of the animation until I remember going into the studio where we were doing it in Vancouver. Uh, I can actually see the studio not too far from here. I'm looking through the, uh, the living room window right here. It's across the Camby Bridge. We're on Camby and 7th, Dick and Rogers at the time. And um, I was brought into the studio. It was a wood paneled studio. They're, they're kind of the mixing stage. And I watched it. It was the one with the racing the clock. Is that the, 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 the race car one? Yeah. And uh, I, was, I was blown away. I, I didn't, I'd never seen it before. So I was like, wow. And remember, this is about six months before um, Toy Story hit the, the movie screens. So this was the first long form CGI program that most people had seen. Wow. That's uh, yeah. I'm, I'm pulling up a picture right now with uh, you uh, going head to head with Megabyte, your uh, one of your main nemesis in this series. Uh, can you tell me what it was like? Uh, did you ever get to really, really hang out with the cast? A lot of animated uh, shows, you actually never meet who you're working with. Were you by yourself or did you get to, uh, you know, get to get to get the vibe off everybody in the room? Well, the short answer to your question is yes and no. <laughs> cool. Uh, so uh, Reboot, like most uh, uh, animated series that was done in Vancouver, they wanted the cast to be together. So we recorded everybody together except for a Megabyte, uh, Tony J, R.I.P., who was based in Los Angeles and was a British actor originally, a Shakespearean British actor. And uh, we never met him doing the show the first season. Only when I got uh, the job of uh, Haji on the new Johnny Quest and I moved to Los Angeles did I meet him in the waiting room of my voice agent, which had recording booth there. And I introduced myself to him. And I remember he was very tall, probably 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and he was like, oh, yes, yes. And we started <laughs> talking. And then after late into the second season, 
because they had always recorded him in Los Angeles, they agreed that I could record my lines by myself in LA after his sessions. So I remember watching him do his lines and he would sit at a chair with a, with a mic in front of him and a mic and a, you know, a music stand with the lines and he would smoke sitting down and he would uh, do each line uh, three times okay. and then he would leave. He was done in maybe 20 minutes. Oh, wow. So then I went in afterwards uh, and I remember a very specific uh, recording session, <clears throat> which was um, at a place on Melrose Avenue called Buzzies. And um, they were doing a Garfield special across the hall. And um, I did all of Bad Bob by myself. Okay. And I remember uh, Chris Bruff, who was one of the executive producers, was directing me. He's like, can you yell more? You're, you're, you're hanging off the side of a truck. Can you, can you yell more? And I'm like, okay. And I remember I, I almost lost my voice at the end of that recording session just by myself. Wow. I was just watching Bad Bob today in preparation, actually. It's, um, right. Uh, we're, you know, Michael, you, you have had a long career, and everybody, we're going to be answering your questions and stuff like that. But um, right. you agreed to the live. I, I, I Usually we have sometimes, sometimes there's hours, and I can pull all these clips and stuff. We got to go through, sure. your, we got to go through your career a little bit here because okay. you've had a long and storied career. And as we joked about before we started the interview, though you did not record a Gundam wing in, um, or Gundam suit in, um, 1979, you did in the nineties. Right. Um, tell yeah. me, tell me about your, like your f first voice acting job. Okay. I, I do want to point that out. So yeah. if you look me up on the IMDb, it says my first credit is 1979. <laughs> uh, I, I was not, uh, doing that job in 79. I did that job in about 93, yeah. where I dubbed the original uh, Japanese show. Uh, my first voiceover job was my second job ever was uh, a cartoon called Barbie and the Rockers. Okay. And I, I was cast as the voice of Ken for Barbie and Ken. Oh, nice. And uh, I was about 17, and somehow it got to the local newspapers. And I got some notoriety in the local newspapers and McLean's, and I did an episode of Midday, which is a kind of an on-camera television show and talking about that. And I was, I was 17 years old. So wow. I figured, oh, my career is going to continue like this. Every job I do, people are going to care. They don't. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, I, 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 from there, I, I did more acting in uh, television shows and movies. Yeah. And I graduated high school. And then I, did, um, I wrote for a television show when I was about 18 with two of my best friends at the time. Okay. And uh, that was a show called Pilot One, and we did that for about six months before the show was canceled. And then um, I did a movie at that time, a Friday the Thirteenth movie, and then I went to uh, oh. university. Okay, we got we got to get into Friday the Thirteenth. Okay, I've been I've been I've right. been I've been waiting on this one. I'm gonna pull up a picture of you as uh, as a young thug, like, right? Showing Jason what you got. Um, tell me about working on a Friday the Thirteenth movie, bud. Uh. I've told the story before. When I auditioned, they did not reveal the name of the movie. It was called Ashes to Ashes. Okay. And all mentions of Jason in the film, in the script, were a guy named Ethan. Okay. And uh, only when I uh, got the movie did they reveal that it was Jason. I still have the script. I just saw it in storage where it's called Ashes to Ashes, and Jason is Ethan in the script. <laughs> wow. And um, the audition. I auditioned with a friend, a guy named Sam Sarkar, and we both got the parts. And uh, we were playing gang members. And um, they were afraid that, you know, people into the occult or into, you know, the, the, you know, the movie franchise of Jason, they would come and, like, do murders on the set or, or try to, like, steal things, which is why they didn't promote what the movie was. Oh, okay. And uh, the guy playing Jason was... Kane Hodder, am I right? In that oh, yes, one? Kane Hodder. Yeah. So he was a, um, a stuntman who had done stunts before, and I believe that was his first appearance as Jason. And I remember he grabs my character and smashes the head into a, a pipe, which was not me. That was a stuntman. And that guy did get uh, scarred from that, that stunt, so I'm glad I never did that oh, my. in the end. Um, and uh, what else do I recall about that movie? We filmed Two Nights. Uh, on the wharf down in Vancouver. And I remember clearly that one of the nights was the night that Rob Lowe 
sang with Snow White at the Oscars because I watched it in my trailer, which was uh, just off the set there. Wow. So um, there's a little trivia for you. That's a lot of trivia. In fact, uh, you appear in so many things, and everybody who, you know, you see this and you see the next time you see Jason takes Manhattan, just, you know, when you when you see that uh, that man get murdered, well, the man who was pointing before, that's Bob. It's cool. I love that. I love seeing actors who appear, right. appear in many things. It's funny. Some, right. Sometimes it's precious to people, and they're like, you're only allowed to play one role. It's like, no, you can play many roles. Right. And what I would like to bring up right now is that although I'm not a huge soap opera fan, I think it's pretty cool that uh, you uh, were on Days of Our Lives. <laughs> that's, yes. That's pretty cool. Um, tell me, tell me yeah. what it's like working on a soap opera. Uh, Days of Our Lives. I did that in around, I don't know, 2003, 2004. Okay. Uh, I, I originally auditioned and the role was supposed to be for about a week's work, uh, which is an episode a day. And uh, I guess they liked what I was doing and they kept writing me in. And I did, I think, almost 40 episodes wow. at the end. So um, my character was a, an evil doctor, underworld doctor who worked for... Um, Demera, what's her name? Miss Demera on the show. Yeah. And, um, and, uh, my character had some sort of serum that he could make people tell the truth and they use it against me in the end. It, it was a lot of fun. When you do a soap opera, as I learned, there's very little rehearsal and you get one take on average, which means they sometimes film the rehearsal. Yeah. So it was kind of being thrown into the water and these people had been doing it for 20, 30 years, some of them. And uh, I remember looking uh, to my right one day in the makeup trailer and, and asking um, the man who played uh, Stefano, I said, uh, you know, I can't believe they're killing me. He goes, don't worry about that. They've killed me 19 times on this show. <laughs> they bring me back every time. Amazing. So um, it, was, it was fun. And the, the irony of it is that my mother started recording the show to watch because I was in it, and now she's addicted. So she keeps watching it and asking me what's happening. And I'm like, I don't know. I haven't been there in about eight years. So <laughs> that's it. That's so, that's so funny. Um, I, have a, I have a picture pulled up here with you and Stefano himself. Um, I, right. and, and when I was a kid and I was watching that show, I was like, oh, that dude is so evil. Um, I'm sure right. he's, and I'm sure he's like a pussycat in real life, Love right? Man. Yeah. Love man. All, all, the, all the best villains on screen are usually the nicest guys because they're like, I just leave it on screen. I don't have to be a jerk right. off. I don't have to be a jerk off screen and all that kind of stuff. All right. So, um, yeah, uh, Michael, if you don't mind me asking you some fan questions, a lot of people sure. have been uh, um, sending them in. I really want to make sure that we care to them. Um, and also, people were sending me questions uh, the other day, so we're going to get to them first. Sure. Okay. Um, all right. Oh, uh, no, can't ask that one yet. Okay, um, all right. Most memorable moment when you recorded Reboot or another series? You know, is there something when you were recording that you remember that day and you're like, oh, wow, this is a, this is a, special, this is a special day? Uh, I, I remember it was recording Reboot, but it was something that never aired, which was a big deal for me. And uh, I posted it on my... Facebook page, um, because we were a new series for ABC and it was something that no one had seen before, they wanted uh, Bob and Dot to host the annual general meeting for children's programming for ABC. So they had us record as though we were introducing the fall lineup for the Saturday morning cartoons. Mm -hmm. And one of the things was that uh, Schoolhouse Rocks was still a part of ABC's Saturday morning lineup at the time. And they wanted me and uh, Kathleen Barr to sing Conjunction Junction. And they had sent me the, uh, the lines to, to read, which are the, you know, the lyrics to the song, Conjunction Junction, What's Your Function, and, and the music. And when I got in there, I said, this is a song I actually know. I've been singing it my whole life. <laughs> so that's something I would love to see if it's out there. It exists. It existed at one point. And uh, I remember doing that. That was a lot of fun. All right. Um... So uh, my, my friend Shamar is asking, he's a great dude. He says, question, Bob is such a unique character. What drew you to taking uh, the, that part? What drew me to taking the role of Bob? Or, choos well, or choosing the characterizations that he had, you know? Okay. Uh, I, I see what you're saying. I was going to say a funny answer, which was I auditioned and I got it, <laughs> thankfully. Um, but, um, yeah, I, 
I've talked about this in, in the past, which is I think that um, one of the things that made the character successful was that I approached him as a reluctant hero, mm -hmm. which was kind of in, inspired by um, Spider-Man growing up. And um, Michael J. Fox was kind of a prototype. And if you can hear a lot of the earlier episodes, I would do stuff where my voice would crack. I'm like, what's going on? You know, kind yeah. of, you know, he couldn't, he wasn't in control exactly. Okay. So he was a guy thrust into this um, kind of responsible position, which he wasn't really prepared for. And uh, I think that was also part of kind of, was he a young man? Was he a teenager? It kind of, they never really were un very clear about what age he was. And I was around 23, which in retrospect, I was still a kid, even though I felt like a man. So, um, speaking of, I, I think that, that I, that I brought that. And if you see some of the uh, DVD extras where the creators talked about it, they said that they originally envisioned Bob as more of a hero in the Michael Bean from aliens mold. Yeah. And that when I started doing the interpretation where it was kind of funny slash cheesy, that they started writing to that. Okay. So, um, for me, I always viewed Reboot, even though it was action and, 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 and adventure, to me, my performance, I always felt it was like a sitcom. So that I was doing kind of comedic, uh, you know, readings of lines as though it was, you know, Bob, Dodd, and Enzo, and Frisket were in a sitcom. And there was the diner and all that kind of stuff, like Seinfeld at the time. Yeah. So, um, so I was doing kind of a comedic, you know, uh, quip kind of a character. That's what I was doing. I've loved, I, you know, I love that answer so much because that's what it really was. Like no matter how much danger they were in, there was still this kind of like, you, you, you know, you felt, you felt like there was consequences, especially at the end of season two, which we will, which we will get to, which makes sure. the, the end of season two so much more heartbreaking based on Bob's lighthearted approach to most things. Right. But he, but you also, uh, you know, you're, you're, he also was kind of like all at, at the same time, he was always kind of like, oh, wow, like that reluctant hero you're talking about. And I can picture now, now that you say that, I can picture Marty McFly saying, oh, this is not good. This is not good. Da yeah, that's a pretty good. That's a pretty good Jay Fox there. Yeah, thank, yeah. Thank you very much. You know, and his version was, oh, this is heavy. But, you know, that's a, right. That, that makes a lot of sense to me now. Right. It's it's a beautiful thing seeing Bob uh, kind of like, you know, he's just this guy that doesn't know what to do, but he, you know, kind of turns into a mentor to uh, en right. Enzo. And um, I just want to get into season uh, two's um, ending right now because, you know, it seems relevant. Uh, season two's ending is that uh, it's it's a total cliffhanger and you think you don't know what's happened to Bob. Megabyte, Megabyte uh, turns on him, throws him into space. I remember being. I remember being deeply affected as a young man watching the show about 11 years old uh, and right. just my jaw dropping and just waiting for the next episode. And, you know, season three was not for a long time. Uh, right. When, when you recorded that scene, was uh, were, were you feeling like, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to happen. But did it affect did it affect you as an actor to like read read that scene like Megabyte? No. Or was I it... remember, I remember yelling no. I remember that laughing about it, and I have to be completely honest. You know, this takes us into this whole season three aspect. Yeah. Um, I did not think much of it. I thought it was a great cliffhanger. I don't know if you have heard or remember the cliffhanger in the '80s of Who Shot Jr. Okay, so For it was sure. kind of like that. I was like, it's a great, um, you know, cliffhanger to bring you to the next season. Um, never did I think that my uh, job was in danger. Uh, I didn't think much of it. And to be completely honest, I did not know they did a season three until it had aired. Because I was basically in Los Angeles from around 95 onwards doing um, Johnny Quest and pursuing my career in Los Angeles. So I would fly back to do things with the, you know, the, the crew in Vancouver. And uh, sometimes I would do it by myself in, in Los Angeles. And I remember coming back to do that one. And um, didn't think much of it. And nobody ever called to tell me that I was fired or let go. And only after the fact that I know that there was a third season. This is before the internet was ubiquitous and everybody yeah. contacted everybody. So I didn't really know too much about it. Mm -hmm. And um, and because of that, I've never seen season three. And um, I don't know too much about it. I know it's darker in tone and, 
And then when they contacted me a few years later to do uh, season four, which ended up being um, the movies, I had been accepted to law school uh, in Winnipeg. I was basically tired of uh, the acting world. And um, I was like, okay, but they fired me. I said to my agent, and she's like, no. And Ian's going to do it, Ian Corlett. And I was confused, and I thought, well, maybe they are going to record both of us, and then they'll just use the one they like. And then when I got the script, I realized that they were using the idea of the voice sounding different in the, in the storyline, and we did the My Two Bobs. Um, but uh, I know Ian had done your, your show, and he had mentioned that I had said something to the effect that they can't fire me, which I never said because I would never even think they would fire me. It kind of presupposes that th someone's threatening to do that. So okay. I, I never knew anything about it. And, uh, you know, I, I harbor no ill will at this point. It's, he's a guy, you know, taking a job as I would have as, as well. Mm -hmm. And um, this is how it was supposed to be, you know, and give such a great storyline to the show that people love. Wow. That's, uh, well, thank, thank you very much for coming on and clearing that up. Um, so, you know, when you come back and you do My Two Bops and that kind of stuff, it's uh, by, yeah. n by now, you know, Reboot's definitely a thing. But you were mentioning before, like, you didn't know Reboot was even popular until, like, later on. You, you did your job. You went, you know, you lived in L.A. and, and, that, and that was it. When was, the first, right. when was the first time a fan ever, like, you know, really freaked out at you and you're, you're like, wait a second, you're a Bob? Because, you know, you're a voice actor, you'll have to tell. <clears throat> Someone will have to tell them, you know, that's Bob from Reboot, right? Right. Like, no, nobody ever stopped me on the street <laughs> and said, I know your voice or ordering pizza or whatever. No. Um, I, uh, I have to just stipulate, because you're in Canada, uh, Reboot aired on YTV, as we're, we're dealing here, three yeah. times a day, I believe. Three times a day every day or three times a week or uh, uh, at least a lot. A lot, yeah. Okay. Okay, so in the United States, it aired on ABC once a week on Saturday mornings for the first two seasons. Later, it was played in repeats on Cartoon Network and things like that. But in Canada, it became a much bigger deal than it was in the United States. Okay. So I remember flying back to Vancouver to do a job. I think it was Reboot. Yeah. And going to customs, and they go, what do you do? I go, I'm an actor. And they go, what do you do? I go, oh, I do like voiceovers. And he goes, like what? I go, um, Reboot. He goes, Reboot. He goes, who are you in Reboot? I go, I'm Bob. The guy literally yelled to the guy in the next kiosk, hey, I got Bob from Reboot here. Then I realized, oh, people watch this show, you know. I didn't really know, and, and you don't know, I've said in many interviews, when Kiefer Sutherland walks down the street, people go, I love 24. <laughs> when I walk down the street, no one says I love Reboot because they don't know that I'm Bob on Reboot. Only when you do a convention do people come and tell you how much they loved you or, okay. or uh, you know, how much they grew up with it. So it's different. And... Um, I, I've, I've told these, there's two anecdotes. Mm -hmm. So I was flying across Canada at one point in the 90s, late 90s, and I happened to be seated next to a woman with her two kids. And the kids were playing with reboot action figures, Bob action figures. Mm -hmm. So the flight was about five hours. So I had a while to think about it. So I finally said, you know, that's me. And she <laughs> turned to me and she said, oh, really? Like in a mall? <laughs> And I was like, what? And then I guess she thought I meant like I do it like in a mall performance where they dress up. I'm like, no, no, no. I do the voice in the cartoon. And she's like, no way. I have to get you to sign something. I said, OK. And I ended up signing an air sickness bag. So someone has that if they still held on to it, you know, a barf bag with my signature on it. <laughs> That's amazing. I'm pulling up a team. Uh, I'm pulling up a picture of the dream team there. Um, so um, uh a person on uh, YouTube is asking, uh, goes by the name non-person human. They said, what inspired Bob? Oh, actually, we did that. We, we did talk about what inspired Bob's voice, you know, the reluctant, right. the reluctant hero. But he also said, and this is, uh, you know, a su this is a subject, and you were telling me about this before, it's very interesting. Uh, what's your thoughts on Reboot the Guardian Code? Um, I've only seen the one episode that I ended up voicing, so mm -hmm. I don't know much about it. I know it's not very popular with the reboot uh, purists, the yeah. uh, the hardcore fans. Yeah. Uh, and you have to understand, you know, uh, when they contacted me originally, they were talking about rebooting reboot. Okay. So I thought I'd have another job. Okay. And then um, I remember they sent me an audition to do the voice of Megabyte because he had passed away and I tried to do my best Tony J 
and they hired a guy who, when I heard it, it was fantastic. I mean, that was really good. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, they wouldn't really tell me what the storyline was. And originally I thought it was going to be, you know, a continuation only later did I realize it was half CGI, half live action. And you have to understand a lot of that stuff is because of budgetary constraints to do a, you know, a full CGI show. It's very, very expensive unless you know, you're going to be doing it over several years where you can amortize the cost. Yeah. So I think they were trying to be clever and, and do something where it was kind of Tron inspired mm. or uh, what was the one we were talking about? Uh, Super Cyber Super Samurai Human Squad. Samurai Cyber Squad, a yeah. little bit of Jumanji. You know, <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so um, you know, sometimes you, you swing for the fences and, uh, and you miss. Maybe they miss this time. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, as a fan's perspective and stuff like that, like, you know, it's not it's not my reboot. And people ask me this all the time. Like, what do you think of it? I'm like, right. oh, well, I'm a 36 year old man <laughs> who uh, right. who loved the old show dearly. But at the same time, if some kid off the street knows what reboot is now because of this, it's kind of like everything kind of matters. You know, they as a result, they might go looking for the old series. You know, hey, this Bob guy is kind of cool. And, uh, you know. Yeah. Now here, here's a little trivia for you. It might sure. go into what you're saying is trivia for you. I recorded that episode of the guardian code on the election day, uh, in 2016 okay. when Trump was elected. So when I went in the studio in that morning, we didn't know how it was going to go out. And I remember at the end of the session talking about it because I was in Los Angeles and they were in Vancouver doing the directing and the recording. So that was that day. Everything changed after that. Yeah. It's not the same. So you're like, this is what happens, everybody, when you don't cast right. me as Bob in every single episode. Bad things exactly. happen. Exactly. Um, I didn't say that. You did. Yeah. You, know, you know what? I Okay. And this is just this is just fan theory, whatever, bull. Everybody sure. out there, you know, they're always, they're always asking me, like, who cares what I think? But I'll say this. I would have had you in there kind of like a Mr. Miyagi type of wise character that even if they only hear your voice coming from an iPad speaker or something, just to kind of instruct them in the ways of a guardian, I would have went like that. It's not too late. The show's still on. Who knows? That, that, that's what I would have done because Bob is synonymous to me with Reboot and without him, it just feels a little feels a little wrong. I to agree me. with you. That would have been a great idea and much more financially uh, beneficial to me. Yeah. But it didn't happen <laughs> that way. But maybe we can retroactively do it and I can, you know, bookend the uh, the episodes. Yeah. You know, who knows? Exactly. All right. We're gonna ask another question. Um Okay. Oh, well, people are saying people are, are saying that, uh, you know, that they named their dog after Enzo and a bunch of cute stuff like that. Uh, the name Bob in a show like this is super cool because when you think of reboot in a computer, I'm surprised he wasn't called Skyblade or or, uh, you know, Pro, yeah. or Protonicon or any something, something a bit right. more computerish. I think that they kept it that close to the vest when it comes to a, a regular, a regular name. That's cool. All right. Um, uh, just. Uh, oh. So uh, this uh, Bernadette uh, Winder, who is so, so hand, uh, so helpful. Thank you so much for the shares and everything like that. This interview is uh, getting seen by a lot of people, and a lot of it is because of you. Thank you very much. She says, out of all the roles you've done, what are some of your favorite ones that you can think of where you're like, oh, man, I really like that one? Um, I get asked that question a fair bit when I do interviews, and uh, I will say this. I have uh, different favorites for different reasons. Uh, I love Reboot because it's a, it's a character that is closest to me, the real me, if that makes any sense. Because when I originally started, you know, it was a young hero and then they kind of wrote to my vocal inflections and my sense of humor and my sensibility. Um, I love Haji uh, in the United States when I, because it was the, the job that got me into the United States, into Los Angeles, allowing me to work with the, my childhood heroes, you know, whether in animation or, or in sitcoms. Uh, I love jobs for the trip that they allow me. I did a job in New York a year and a half ago. I was there for two weeks on an episode of a show called FBI. Not much of an acting job, but I got to hang out in New York. All expenses paid for two weeks. Wow. I've done jobs where I did movies in India, in Morocco. Um, so when you, when you see, you know, actors much more famous than me doing movies, sometimes 
look at where they film the movie because sometimes sometimes they do it for the trip. Yeah. Like Elvis. <laughs> hey right. guys, we're gonna go film in Hawaii. Hey, that was nice. Let's film in Hawaii again. That's right. All right, um, let's talk about Haji here. Um, you mentioned Johnny Quest, a real adventure of the Johnny Quest. I thought this show was so cool when it came out. Um, you know, half uh, they were really uh, touching based on the like the computer animation too. Uh, right, tell, right. Me, tell me about playing Haji. Um, that's a real Hollywood story. I was on vacation ish in LA, uh, uh, basically to pitch a, a sitcom idea with some friends I'd made in LA. And when I got there, they canceled the pitch meeting, but they said, do you still want to do the practice pitch with our agent? And I said, okay. So at that dinner, this woman was introduced to me and they introduced me as Michael as an actor friend of ours from LA from, from Vancouver. And um, she said, uh, can you do a Middle Eastern accent? And I said, yes. She goes, there's a famous cartoon company is doing a classic character who's Middle Eastern. And I was like, there is no such character. I've been waiting for that my whole life. There's only one guy, which is Aladdin, and he has no accent. And, uh, and she went to the washroom, and my friends are like, why are you being like this? And I said, because I've been waiting for this role my whole life. It doesn't exist. And uh, the next day I went to her office. And the, her assistant said, it's a show called Johnny Quest. I said, I know the character. I go, but he's not Middle Eastern. He is uh, Indian. And he says, same thing. And I was like, okay, welcome to Hollywood. And he goes, can you do uh, an Indian accent? I said, I can do an Indian accent. But if I remember the show, I mean, the character is seven years old. I said, I'm good, but I'm not that good. I won't sound seven. He goes, no, he's 17 now. I said, that I could do. And at that moment, I realized that I had a real opportunity to be able to work in Los Angeles and in the United States. And um, I called around and I got uh, Andrea Romano, who was the voice director on Reboot at the time and was the director of Animaniacs and Batman. Her office referred me to an agent, a voice agent at ICM, which was the biggest uh, voice agent in the world at the time. And they took a meeting with me and they got me a job and uh, got me in the United States to play Haji. Wow. Um, we were mentioned, yeah. um, Haji, something I loved, uh, I'm just going to make sure this graphic doesn't cut off my head. All right. Uh, something I loved about Haji, uh, kind of like the same way in the Green Hornet where everybody really likes Kato. Like the Green Hornet's a little useless. And it's all about what okay. Kato's going to do. I thought the same way about Johnny Quest. I'm like here out of the two of them, Johnny's kind of the hothead that gets them in trouble. And Haji's the one that always kind of saves, you know, saves the day or keeps them cool right. or teaches them. the first episode. I was doing as I was doing research. The coolest thing is Haji was teaching him how to untie himself if he's ever <laughs> tied up. Right, and that just right. that just goes to show. Like I I love that about the character where it you know you you're not just this one note best friend. You're actually you know you're actually the thing holding it together. So that's why I love oh, about Haji. Cool. I know that they wanted to take a more realistic approach as opposed to the '60s version where it was kind of a made up mysticism, the Simpson Salabim. We never did that. Uh, and uh, they wanted to base it in real, like he was a real yogic, you know, practitioner and there was controlled breathing and things like that. So uh, the, 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 the writer producer of the show at the time, a guy named Peter Lawrence had grown up in, um, East Africa and was very, um, very worldly. He knew a lot about a lot of things and he wanted to make a more realistic portrayal, which is, I think why I was cast my performance, uh, uh, the accent I was doing was kind of a colonial Indian accent, which was kind of, a, I called him like a Gandhi junior. Mm -hmm. So I think he wanted a kind of that kind of uh, accent as opposed to it, which was the time people were trying to do the Apu sound alike. Yeah. And, uh, that, that was a, I think, I think that was a really good choice to kind of just, you know, definitely, definitely play it more real. Cause it comes off that way. It's called the real adventures of Johnny quest, not the, right. not the hokey adventures of Johnny quest. Right. Sure, his dad and him go fight ghosts and mummies, but still. <laughs> right. All right. All right. Uh, we have a whole bunch of other questions. Um, my friend Alan Legro, you say, as an actor, you put parts of yourself into a character. My question right. is, are there any parts of the character, Bob, that became a part of you? Are there any parts of the character. role of Bob that became the, the character of Bob that, that became a part of me? Yeah. Uh, you know, I always wanted a glitch and I guess with my iPhone, I have one. I don't know. <laughs> That's a great answer. 
you are you are good at what you do. Um, now that's that's actually that's actually the best answer I possible. I was I, I was wondering what you're going to say as I was reading. I'm like, now that's that that's even better. All right, uh, we have a whole bunch of people. Uh, too many of you are asking for shout outs, unfortunately. So we we can't do that today. You can't shout out every single. How about we just do a shout out to all of Canada? There you go. What's up, Canada? <laughs> you're you're uh, and the United States. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, I, I need to bring something up. I need to bring something up to you that I thought was personally uh, very, very cool is that uh, as I was going through your Facebook page, which everybody should follow, by the way, everybody should follow uh, Michael Binier on um, Facebook. Um, it's, it's the same name in the description. Look it up. He uh, he has wonderful stuff on there, including your adventures working on the series Sonic the Hedgehog. Right. Um, the hedgehog. I put it up last week. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to bring up this. Is that uh, here is a here's a photo of of you and Alexandra Daddario <laughs> that when you worked on the oh, yeah. movie The Change Up and uh, she is she is something. That's that's what I'll say on the internet. She is something. Uh, what what was the what was Miss Daddario like the, in person? The movie is called The Layover. And uh, it stars Alex Daddario and Kate Upton about two best friends who go on a trip and they get stuck on a layover and they both start uh, competing for the same guy. I am not that guy. <laughs> they are they are competing for the same guy and then they're stuck there and at the same hotel is a jeweler's convention. And I played an Israeli jeweler, an Israeli jeweler okay. who trying to pick up Kate Upton throughout the whole movie and uh, he's not and she's not interested in him and it's quite funny and um, I uh, a lot, I've seen the final edit of the movie and a lot of it was cut out but my character was a real kind of um, sexist kind of pig guy and he was taking naked photos of the girls when they were at a, in a, a, a pool scene okay. and uh, and uh, one of the scenes was uh, Alex came out of the pool and her uh, she popped out of her bathing suit and I'm sitting there with a fake iPhone as though I'm taping this. And I said to her, uh, FYI, you're actually showing right now. And she's like, Oh my God, thank <laughs> you so much. So, um, she was really cool. We hung out on the set. There's a big dance sequence. We were all there for a couple of days. Also in the movie was Molly Shannon, Cal Penn. And we all did this kind of, um, choreographed dance, which was cut out of the final film, even though there is a dance sequence in the movie. But it was really great. I got to dance with Molly Shannon, and I was like, "Oh my God, I'm living like in an SNL sketch." She was going crazy, kind of like you know, uh, yeah. superstar. So, uh, but Alex was really great. I ran into her at the premiere in LA, and we caught up then. And um, cool girl, and Kate was really great as well. Amazing. Um, I, a picture is worth a thousand words, and I think this picture screams, "You lucky son of a gun!" <laughs> All right, uh, getting on to. Uh, getting on. Oh, as as my as my girlfriend says, she's my kryptonite. Yes, yes, sweetie, that is that is definitely. Got right. it. No, sweetie, you're my kryptonite. Come on. She's also my kryptonite. Anyway, uh, anyway, getting to it. Um, so, uh, on behalf of all the fans, we're really happy that you, uh, you know, you did reprise the role in season four and even had a brief cameo in um in the this new reboot series. But um, a lot of people are always at, uh, a lot of people are always asking what's your favorite character. We've gone through that. But um, what what is your favorite on screen role? Because that is a whole other ball game. My favorite on screen role, uh, like I said, for different reasons. I'm really proud of the work I did um, last season on a show called The Expanse, which is on Amazon. Mm -hmm. And um, because um, for the first time in many years. I was uh, cast um, to play without an accent, and um, and um, I got to do scenes with um, Shore Agdeshlu, who plays my wife in the show, and um, she plays the president of the world, basically of the United Nations. Yeah, and um, my character. Uh, was originally played by Brian George, kind of intermittently for the first three seasons, and then he wasn't available because he was doing another series, and I got tapped to do it. And when I originally auditioned, I did it with an accent, and uh, which was kind of an Indian accent. And when I got on the set, they said, hey, you know what? Forget the accent, just do it like you. 
Cool. So that was a real kind of uh, welcome change. And I'm really glad with a lot of uh, how it came out. A lot of the work came out. Oh, man. That's that. Oh, one sec. All right. There we go. That's 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 awesome. You know, like uh, a lot of people I know, they really love that show, The Expanse. And I, I got to yep. get I got to get into that. Um, Michael, thanks so much for coming by today. Everybody will do a uh, weave. Oh, um, so, OK, well, they are bringing up Gundam. Uh, Gundam was all the way back in the day. And that was one of your right. first jobs. Uh, we talked right. about the future and your, the current. Let's let's just visit the past right there. I'll bring up a picture sure. of Gundam. Uh, Gundam is beloved by many of the anime fans that follow uh, this show and uh, anime in general. Uh, can you talk? Uh, can you tell us uh, some stories yeah. you remember about Gundam? Um, Gundam Wing is a is a Japanese show that was dubbed into English in the early '90s. So you got to remember, I started doing cartoons in the late '80s. I did uh, Barbie and Barbie and the Rockers, and then I did uh, GI Joe in, in like '89. Mm -hmm. Then I did um, a show called Exo Squad. And I was doing a lot of stuff while I was in school still, you know, university. And I was not as interested in doing prelay animation because it's kind of laborious. It's just you go in and you're watching someone else's thing and you do it to fit the time. And it doesn't it didn't pay as much as doing prelay. So I didn't really care as much about it. I didn't pursue it that much. But sometimes they, I would do auditions and I would get one or two. Mm -hmm. And one of them was Gundam Wing. And I didn't really realize how popular it was. I did another show at the time called Ran Ma One Half, where I played like a nerdy character. I think his name is Gosen Kugi, if I'm right. So uh, doing um, Gundam Wing, I did a character named Makuve. And I didn't get to see the show. They would just bring up the episodes of when the character was in a scene, and I would do those lines. So I really don't know the storyline. I don't know what was happening. I would just do those lines. But I do remember that I chose a voice kind of inspired by, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, I can't believe I'm at a loss for words. Rocky Horror Picture Show. He plays um, Frankenfurter. Okay. Oh, um, oh, geez. Ah, ah, I know this. Oh, my God. Key cred crumbling before. I eyes. worked with him on Johnny <laughs> Quest. Yeah. Wonderful actor. Yeah. Um, oh, my God. Tim. Tim Curry. Tim. Tim Curry. Yeah. And uh, Sorry so the brain part. <laughs> it was a very Tim Curry kind of voice. It's like, yeah, you know, he talked like this, you know. So uh, I did that Makuve like that. And it's amazing because those shows have a whole niche audience to themselves. Yeah. And uh, when I do conventions, there's a whole kind of percentage of people that want to talk to me about, you know, Gundam Wing or Ryan Mob One Half. And I don't know the story as much because I didn't read the scripts, only the dubbing scripts when I went in. Okay. That's, uh, that's, uh, yeah, that, that, that's what I keep hearing from people. Because as fans, when we consume the media you produce, we see finished right. products. Like you're like, I'm aware of the flower of the cake you right. all, you all uh, ate later on. And it's, right. and, and many, many voice actors have said the th same thing. And I think to myself, well, that actually makes a lot of sense. I mean, why would you spend all your all your time watching your own work? <laughs> I mean, well, I mean, there are some times where yeah. somebody directs the episode, That's so they true. have to watch it. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember Mike Donovan, who ended up being the voice director on Reboot. He also did direction in animation, dubbing things. And so he would see it. Um, so he knew the storylines. I remember I did one with him. No one will ever remember this show. I don't even know if it was sold. It was called The North and Trolls, about the trolls that, with the big hair. And I did a character named Bogey. Okay. And, I mean, he knew the show inside and out because he was directing it. Yeah. So, um, and then I myself have directed some dubbing things. I did something in Los Angeles a few years ago. It was a show from China. And you know the show inside and out, and you're directing the little kids who are doing the voices, and you, and you know it, and you you know the, the minutiae of the show. Okay. So it really depends, like you're saying, your relationship with it. Yeah, it, it's, and that, that, that's just, uh, it's beautiful stuff, man. Um, I just like, um, I'm not sure how much more time you have, and I'm uh, checking on the time. And I don't I, even know how long we've been talking, but <laughs> I mean, so we, if they have questions from the internet, we can answer them. Awesome. Thank you so much. So everybody right now, uh, if we haven't answered your questions, um, besides shout outs, we can't pick any favoritism today because Bob can't 
<laughs> Bob can't uh, shout out 10 people. It's not fair to the others. But we will, uh, we will definitely uh, be answering everyone's questions right here. Okay. Um, I, okay. Sorry. One sec, one second. Oh. Okay, here we go. Pat, uh, this is from a, a gentleman named Patrick. How does it feel to be one, be one of the pioneers of fully computer animated television? There are pioneers of many things. We, neither you or I will ever be the pioneers of Warner Brothers or Disney or, uh, or Cell Animation, but you can pretty much say that I'm the first dude, the first voice you hear in a CGI animated show. How does that feel? If this did not happen to me personally, I would have laughed at that question. But this happened to me a few years back. I was uh, dinner at my girlfriend's place in Los Angeles, and uh, her neighbors came over. And somehow it came up, animation. The guy was working in animation. And I said, oh, I worked on a show. And he goes, what's the show? I said, Reba. He goes, what? In his textbook from learning how to computer animate, there was a whole chapter on Reboot. And my name was in this book. So it's like historical to some anim computer animators today. So I know a lot of big CGI directors and animators started at Mainframe doing Reboot and went on to do other things. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have another question. This is from uh, uh, Marfleet1987. Would you uh, come back as Bob if uh, the old Reboot ever gets picked up again? Let me think about that. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yeah. amaz amazing all right um yeah uh whew, sorry there's a lot there's a lot there's a lot to read on multiple that's okay. platforms that's fine you're kind here's of here's another anecdote i'll you're, tell you're, while you look for a good question you're popular man I, that's all i can say yeah, is you're super popular. reboot is popular i don't know about me per se well you but, should be uh, everybody that's the I, instagram down there I, follow this gentleman what what the hell come on right <laughs> I did a movie, it was in 1996, 97, it was a movie called Underworld, not the movie with the lichens. Mm. It was a mob movie with Dennis Leary and Joe Mantegna. And in the movie, I played a hitman uh, with uh, Joe Mantegna. So I had this scene and we filmed it over several days because it took place in a limousine. So Joe Mantegna and I got to talking and he asked me what I do. And I said, I'm in town doing... Uh, cartoons and back and forth to LA. And he goes, do you know this woman named Andrea Romano? And I said, yeah, she got me into the States because I did Reboot and then I got Johnny Quest. And he said, oh, what did you do with Andrea? I said, I did a show called Reboot. And he said, what do you do on Reboot? <laughs> and I said, are you familiar with Reboot? He goes, yeah, I know Reboot. And I said, um, how do you know Reboot? He goes, my daughter is eight years old. She's autistic. For months, she's been saying, reboot, reboot, reboot. One Saturday morning, I come downstairs, and she points at the TV, and she shows reboot, and it, because she responded to the geodesic designs of the computer animation. I said, I got it. I said, well, I said, I do a character named Bob on reboot. He goes, yo, Bob, on reboot. And I said, yeah. He kind of looked at me, shook his head, and he goes, wait till I tell my wife I met Bob from reboot. So you never know who's a fan of reboot. You never know. That's, oh man, that's amazing. Uh, my friend Nadia is asking, uh, what was your f favorite, like, I, I know it's, I'm sure you don't watch Reboot all the time to, uh, you know, memor right. memorize this, but I'm sure there must have been, for technical reasons, a favorite episode and a, war and a least favorite episode. Please. My favorite episode, I've been asked this before, was Wizards and Warriors. And oh, yeah. from our uh, I remember I loved it because there was a lot of humor in it. It was very densely written. And um, I remember that we wrote, we, we did so much recording that didn't even make it to the final show because there was so much stuff in it. Uh, and then there was a lot of more improv in that episode, kind of things that we added that made it in. And I remember giving suggestions to Mike Donovan, who played uh, Mike the TV at the time, who was also the director. And <laughs> the, the line which made it in was uh, kind of a go away, boy, you bother me. Kind of like the WC Fields thing, which he he ended up doing as Mike the TV. So it was a lot of fun, that one. I think that that is what the best use of the idea of reboot, because normally when the characters would reboot into a game, they would just simply be shooting and, or racing. Whereas in the Dungeons and Dragons spoof, the characters 
had to become different characters. So it was an acting job within an acting job, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah, of course. And that, and that's so that's sp- why I like that one. Speaking of acting job and in, in an acting job, you uh, you posted the Sonic the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog clip. Yeah. Which I would just like to say to everybody out there, uh, reboot the series. You could watch for free on the uh, totally legal on the Tubi TV app, and you can also watch the Adventures of Sonic the Hedgehog, in which you play uh, a rat character named Lawrence. Now, what I find yes. fascinating I- about about this series yeah, is that yeah. a bunch of cast members of Reboot and Beast Wars and all those people play various henchmen on that show. And it's sure. if you look at the IMDb, it's like kind of like a greatest hits of uh, of uh, mainframe entertainment stuff. Um, yeah. t- talk, talk to me about uh, the, clip, yeah. the clip you posted on your Facebook page in which there's a character acting as another character. And it's. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So because of we've had this kind of downtime during the, you know, the isolation of quarantine, I decided it would be a good time to look pa- back over my career and, and find clips and put them on my Instagram mm-hmm. and my Facebook page. And I kind of went through the greatest hits early on, some of the things people wanted to see. And then I remembered that I had done an episode of Sonic the Hedgehog in around 1993. And I didn't even remember the, the episode name or what really what it was about. And, but everything is on the internet. So I Googled it and I found it and I watched it last week and then I managed to download it and put a little clip on the Instagram. And my character was a little rat who had been forced by Dr. Robotnik to uh, drive a sonic <laughs> robot that looked like Sonic the Hedgehog to okay. make Sonic look bad. Yeah. And I do remember the recording session. Uh, Long John Baldry, RIP, played Dr. Robotnik in that series. Uh, Gary Chalk and Phil Hayes, who are good friends of mine, and Phil is in L.A. most of the time now, and I see him there, were, were cast as the henchmen, just they had been the henchmen in, in Reboot. Yeah. Um, and um, they were longtime friends, and they had a great rapport together, kind of improving off each other, playing off each other. And they were doing so many episodes of that show. I think they did 65 episodes. Yeah. So they didn't really read the, the scripts too closely. They would go in and and do he would kind of circle his lines phil i remember this and i remember doing the one day together and uh and, and gary would kind of talk like this and do the would go like this and then oh my God. phil was like this crazy chicken kind of talking like this <laughs> and they would kind of argue and bicker like this and i went in and my character was supposed to be kind of a, it was called pseudo sonic the episode so he was he was a pseudo sonic and i did kind of a high squeaky voice like a teenager. And I remember they didn't want me to sound like Jaleel White, who, who is not there. He was done in Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And um, so Pur- I, I guess my, if I could have done kind of a more of a, of a Jaleel White voice, but I didn't want to do that. They wanted me to sound different. So I did kind of a high squeaky voice. And then you can see that clip on my Instagram, and my Facebook. Yeah. And speaking of everybody, this little bar you see down here, uh, it is uh, that that is his Twitter and his Instagram. And make sure you follow because, uh, you know, given the given the content you've been putting on it, fans like me, it's a it's just a dream to be able to see this kind of stuff. I saw you. uh, Yeah. You put pictures of scripts on any requests that anybody has that they want to see that they want me to put up, you know, because I don't know what people want to see. It's funny. These these kids from somewhere in the U.S. contacted me like about a year ago. And they and they were fans of this character named Banji Castillo that I did on Hot Wheels World Race. <laughs> they were like, "Would you please put it up?" So when I started putting up old clips, they're like, "Where's Banji? Where's Banji?" I'm like, "Oh, man, I forgot about Banji." So I had to go <laughs> find the clip, and, you know, and find that and put up Banji. And uh, and like you said, people like yourself remember things I don't even remember. Wow, that's it. So, yeah, that's 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 incredible, and it's just an amazing time that. Uh, people can have that kind of interaction uh, with yeah. people that they adore and stuff like that. And it's uh, great. So make sure you look it up. It's the Michael uh, Benier uh, fan page. That is definitely the place to go. And you're going to be posting stuff, um, including maybe even this interview. You never know. But right. uh, I will uh, put a link to it for sure. Uh, yeah. Amazing. All right, Michael. Uh, thank you so much for calling in. I don't want to take up all uh, your time. I'm just going to verify that YouTube we are in fact, oh my goodness, geez, there are so many people that like you. This is insane. It's uh, 
it, it's it's kind of it's kind of incredible. I've been doing this project for many years, and we've been doing the live uh, th- we've been doing the live shows. But uh, this instantaneous reaction, considering only two days ago we yeah. mentioned this was going to happen, this is this has been really great. How do how do you awesome. how do you feel about all your fans still uh, digging your stuff so much after all these years? There's no other word to use than it's an honor. It's humbling that something I recorded at 23 years old, just down the street, I can see it right here. Um, still resonates with people around the world and means something to people. And as I've said at conventions, um, I'm just one person, part of a huge production, writers, producers, animators, you know, symphonies, like you're saying, musicians, editors, all those people went to make Reboot and make Bob. I just happened to be in the right place at the right time. I sounded like they imagined and they gave me the ball and I ran with it for how many yards on the football field of animation. And it's, it's really nice. And, um, I hope that I can continue to do stuff that affects people and touches people. Amazing. Well, thank you very much for calling in, Michael. This has been great. Everybody on there, make sure you, uh, follow us, follow us on Instagram, follow us on uh, Twitter, same thing at you, me and YTV, but make sure you check out this gentleman. That's the most important part because, uh, frankly, the content he's putting out is fantastic. And if you are watching this, you will want to watch that. So um, thank you, everyone, for uh, thank you everyone for uh, coming and watching. It's me, it's you, me, and YTV. So it's all of us. It's without you watching. And it, one last word for me. Oh, yeah. Stay frosty. Nice. Stay frosty. Yes. All right, all right. Uh, take it easy, everyone. See you next week. I don't believe we're going to be live, but we are going to be uh, finding.